This is Mike Moyer. I've been a gaffer for 40 years, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I'm a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. Today's guest is Mike Moyer. He is a legendary gaffer with over 40 years of experience working on major Hollywood pictures and TV shows. I mean, to name a few, this is just a few. Risky Business, Breakfast Club, Steel Magnolias, Single White Female, The Town, Eastbound and Down, I Feel Pretty, Gilmore Girls. It goes on and on and on. He's actually currently right now working on Fargo season four. So this guy is incredible and he has so many stories to tell. Um, we also have a little bit of a discussion on the coronavirus and how it's affecting uh, filmmaking. Um, Fargo season four was shut down because of the coronavirus, as well as many, many other uh, movie studios and, and TV shows and commercial production companies. And it's making a huge impact in production. And we have a, a pretty good discussion about that at the very beginning of the show. But then we immediately dive into lighting techniques, um, the gear packages that he's using and recommends, um, you know, how he works with directors and some of the craziest and most bizarre behind the scenes stories that you have ever heard on this show. I'm telling you, Mike does not hold back at all. He lets you know exactly what he's thinking, exactly what he's feeling, and he is ready to share some stories that you guys are going to absolutely want to hear. All right, let's dive into our interview because Mike Moyer has a lot to say that you guys are going to love hearing. So I'm here with Mike Moyer, a uh, legendary gaffer of basically everything you've ever seen. <laughs> so welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for being on. Oh, thanks. I'm glad to be here. I have to start the conversation with what's probably having the biggest impact on the production industry right now, coronavirus. I'd love to know kind of how you've seen the industry change over the past couple of weeks. Um, and we're not going to belabor this because honestly, it constantly changes and we're not doctors and there's really no reason for us to be yapping about it that much. But I think it's making a huge impact in production and I want to start there. But don't worry, guys listening, because uh, there is going to be a lot about lighting and gaffing and techniques and Mike's experience on every set of every movie and TV show you've always known and loved. There's a lot to this, but you know, we've got to start with the impact of coronavirus because it's it's having a huge effect on production. What have you been seeing out in Chicago and out in your industry? Well, we uh, I'm working presently on Fargo season four uh, with Dana Gonzalez as the DP and Pete Council. Um, the uh, what happened about the beginning of the week was that the awareness finally hit the movie set that we're 200 people or more jammed into small spaces yeah and people and people are afraid of this disease i mean there is a you know they're buying toilet paper for crying out loud anyhow the fears started building over the weeks and what what happens especially in the movie business is people start you know it's like noah holly you know you're starting to get pressure from home to get your ass home mm -hmm. and that that started driving the bus, and by Thursday, there and it's kind of contagious. The uh, this kind of I don't want to call it paranoia because it's it's real. The, the disease is real. People are sick. You know, it's it's growing, and we have to do something about it. Well, Anyhow, fe I mean, fear is contagious. People are are afraid for for people are for better afraid. or for worse. It's the fear of it that people are really. Right. That's the contagious part. Um, that's making a lot of decisions like closing down sets and schools and all that stuff. Uh, those decisions are being made um, certainly based on the science and what we're seeing and what we're learning, but it's a scary. Yeah. And all the sets in Chicago, we were the first one to close down. We closed down. We made an announcement Thursday afternoon mm. or Thursday night. And uh, by then uh, all the uh, Wolf, you know, uh, Fire PD and uh, Chicago Med all shut down. Oh, they finished their season. They just said, we're done. Yeah. Uh, mm. On Friday, Friday was their last shooting day. And uh, Empire is going to continue, but there, every other show, all the pilots are shut down. I have talked to people in Boston. Um, the Disney show 
with only a, less than a week left, shut down for 30 days to finish. Uh, we only have, on Fargo, only have uh, three weeks of work left. Uh, uh, L.A. is completely shut down. There, uh, Matt Loeb is applying for some kind of federal relief, but, you know, uh, politics as they are, that'll never happen. And because uh, Broadway is shut down. So we have something like 50,000 employees out of work as of Friday because of this. this. So just so people understand, I mean, we are the entertainment business. To make our product involves hundreds of people in a room at one time. You know, we don't work alone in a cubicle in an office. We work very next to each other for, you know, extended periods of time. And, uh, uh, you know, so, and actors do the same thing on Broadway and so on. And so, yes, our industry is actually devastated, you know, there are people, most people live check to check in a month of unemployment is going to be frightening. Is that what you're hearing out there? That it's about a month that people can expect to not be working? Well, we're, people are saying optimistically two weeks and I'm perfectly happy to accept that, yeah. but uh, uh, I can't guarantee that that's going to, you know, I can see it. I can see it being the tax time about the middle of April before production gets started back up mm. full time. You mentioned a name there, Matt Loeb, um, who is the president of the um, the union for GNE, right? Or, or, or uh, I, IATSE. IATSE. Uh, all, 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 all what they call below the line crafts, cinematographer on down, uh, production designers are all in the IATSE. Everybody except for directors and actors are in the IA and teamsters, drivers. And uh, on movie sets and theater, it's everybody. So, you know, except for the actors. So his, you know, he's certainly an influential person in our industry. Um, whether yes. you're whether you're in the union or not, I mean, what you guys are going to do is going to impact what everybody's going to do, even in the non-union world. Well, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not very knowledgeable of a non-union world that exists because I've spent most of my life organizing every person who can walk on a film set. So. Yeah. I don't, you know, I mean, I believe there's non-union production, but I believe that there are union people working on non-union production. I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. You know, I think L.A., New York, um, maybe Atlanta now, uh, Chicago certainly has thriving, you know, union productions. But I think in smaller cities, Philadelphia, Boston, you know, Tampa, things like that, I think that there's the, the way to survive is non-union in a way. And here's the thing. OK. We will organize as a union everything that moves if we can. Yeah. The fact of the matter is there really is very small pockets of non-union people. There are a few, but the fact is there are non-union productions, and non-union productions we're perfectly allowed to work on. There's nobody saying you can't work on a non-union production. The only thing we say as a union member working on a non-union production is that if the production is balloted, if the production goes for a long enough time that they are noticed by the union and a union representative by federal law walks on the set, he's protected to walk on the set and ballots that crew, which is the working crew of that, then as a union member, you have to vote yes for that ballot. That's all it means. Other than that, you can work all the non-union work you want and you but you're not going to get your benefits, you know, and it's all about benefits. So the difference between union and non-union, and especially in the film world, which is a world that I've worked very hard at making um, graduated pay scales for different budgets. In other words, you do not pay the same thing for a gaffer on a $1 million movie than you do on, when I started, you paid the same price no matter what. You started at 8.30 in the morning, and it was overtime if they started any other time. Okay. So I mean, things have changed, and the fact is that the that production, we have adjusted the union to make it acceptable, so that if you come to me and say I want to make a five hundred thousand dollar movie, I'm going to put people on that job for fifteen dollars an hour. Mm. I'm going to make it work for you, and that's what the where the union has been so much better than the auto workers or the steel workers or um, ten other unions in the country because we have adapted to the industry needs. And the fact of the matter is, is that if uh, if 
you are going to do it. You as a producer will do a non-union show. I'm willing to bet you will be hard fought to find non-union people because it is my mission as a union member and a a 42-year union member to make sure that every person who touches a light, touches a cable, and if they're not a student, and I would take students as in, I need, I'm in a growth industry that is starving for labor. I want everybody to have health insurance and pension mm. at, a, at a 13% cost to you, which is what it is. It's 13%. Uh, How, what do you mean? Than, in other words, the overhead, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but the overhead, uh, when you hire somebody at $30 an hour, it costs you $45 an hour with uh, Social Security, tax, whatever. You know, you're, whatever it is, it costs you a certain percentage to hire that person. Mm-hmm. If he's a union person, it's 13 or 14% more. That's all. Okay. And for that, he, that union person gets pension and health care. Yeah, yeah. So for a person that is thinking to themselves, I'm afraid to... Because I think what what you hear sometimes, not often, but what you hear sometimes is, I'm afraid to join a union because I won't be eligible to do non-union. It sounds like that's not true. And Absolutely so not So I think true. clearing that up might be really helpful. By that's, the way, we weren't intending on talking about this at all. <laughs> so for people that are listening, like this is completely just came out of thin air, but I'm interested, and I know that our listeners would be interested, because I think we have a lot of people that are listening to the show that are... Uh, really enthusiastic about filmmaking, want to get into it, um, maybe dabbling in it a little bit. Obviously, the professionals that do this may already know this information. There's a lot of people that I think don't really understand how the union works and may be afraid of it because they think it could be limiting. It, it limits nothing. We've never limited a person from shooting anything from a you know dog walking down the street to a $100 million movie. All we're trying to do is make sure that everybody who works in our industry has health insurance and works under a contract. And our contracts have been adjusted constantly for the needs of the industry as the industry changes and grows. I guarantee anybody who wants to get in the union will get in the union. There is no, the close, the days of the closed shop are over. Mm. There are you know, if you are on a show and it's organized, that's an instant way in. If you do, if you meet the federal guidelines for joining the union, you will get in. You know, if you meet the residency uh, demands that you live in a place that, you know, we do have things we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid the what we call the gypsy worker, which is the guy who couch surfaces around the country and works as a local in three or four, like me, like in three or four different locals. <laughs> You know, because I'm a local in Chicago, I was a local in Boston, and I'm a local in uh, L.A. Yeah. So, so if know. somebody if somebody has a non-union production company, they want to hire people that are in the union. How does that happen? Nope. Just hire them. Hmm. Just hire them, and they can they have to decide whether they want to do it or not, and whether they want to work without a contract or not. But yes, just hire them. Is there an expectation to like set certain rates or pay a little bit more or no. how, how does the payment go? How does the payment work? No, it's the same. It, you, you as the producer set the rules. Yeah. The only responsibility that that union person has on your job is that if a business agent from a local ballots your job. And what does that mean, ballot your job? In other words, by federal law, the business agent of a local can walk on your set, pass out a card to each employee and say, do you want the union to bargain for you or not? Mm. Basically, I mean, I'm simplifying it, but that's it. Now, every employee has a right to say no. If if you lose the election, you're still non-union. But the only thing that the union member has to do, the only thing he's mandated over a non-union member is he has to vote yes. He wants representation. That's all. That's the only difference. I want, a non-union production. I want to transition a little bit into, you know, your life's work. Lighting, gaffing, um, making film and TV shows look amazing. Um where did you get started? Do you, I, I'm seeing that you started in theater. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what's popping up on my notes. 
Yeah, I started at the Goodman Theater in Chicago in 1970. I, I was a student for about one year, and then I went to work as uh, an electrician uh, on staff for about, well, until 1975. Are you finding that a lot of people that go to gaffing films, do they start in theater? Like, is that a natural pathway for people? It's the best actual technical learning ground for anybody in the lighting and production end of this business. Because Why is that? It has, because it's the most organized, specific. There are books written on what you're supposed to do every minute of your day. It's, it's kind of like going to boot camp. Really? If you don't have a theatrical background, it's, I mean, it made my transition into the film business in 1979 the easiest thing and made me very valuable because I had a strong technical background and I also had a work ethic that was established by the theater. So yes, I think if you're going to go into film and you want to be valuable as a production person, production manager, stage manager, whatever, uh, assistant director, um, or as a lighting sound you need the boot camp of the American theater. Let's talk about the role of a gaffer on a film set. What do you think are some of the misconceptions people have? And what are you actually responsible for? I'm responsible for implement, for creating a, a language between me and the cinematographer. That's my main job. And to be able to hire the right people to keep a crew together and to keep the crew together. But I need to have my whole time focused on being next to the cinematographer. I am not, I don't have to be the technical genius I used to be when I was a best boy or a lamp operator or a board operator. I am, my job is to create a visual language with a cinematographer and implement that. Mm. That's my job. Simple. Mm. Simple. How do you go about that? Be, how do you go about that process? Like it's how, all about relationships. Everything in everything in the cinema, everything working below the line in cinema and filmmaking. I call myself a motion in the motion picture industry. Yeah. Is every single thing about it is about relationships. And if you can't maintain relationships, you failed. And my job also is to give the director with the cinematographer 50 minutes out of every hour to be with the actors yeah. and to be directed. That's a really, really good point that you're kind of that go between um, between the director and the cinematographer, allowing the director to take as much time as they want or need with the talent. That's huge. And I had the luxury of watching you work on set of Fargo, which was awesome. Uh, really good experience. And you had a way of working with many departments and you were kind of always in the middle of everything. You were always in the middle of the discussions. You were making things happen. You were getting things done. And I'm looking at you and I'm saying, I'm thinking to myself, you know, if, if you were to just watch you on set, I think a lot of people would think that you were directing it because the amount of time that you're spending sort of organizing people and going between departments, that is what I think a lot of people assume a director does. Now, my job is to do all that crap. My job is to, you know, work, is to, the director and the cinematographer have to have a relationship. And my job is to get everybody moving in a certain direction. Now, the, depending on how strong your department heads are, depends how easy your job is. Mm. You know, um, but, but the truth is, is that it all comes down from the cinematographer on a set. And you have to be able to disperse that data to, Everybody, and the only way to do that is for everybody to kind of hug it out in the morning, to all be close. And so my, you know, it's kind of a social, it's a social culture that you have to develop. Mm. I want to dive a little bit more into the actual equipment that you're using. You've seen, I mean, you've been doing this since the late 70s, early 80s in the film industry. You must have seen so much change in the actual equipment. I mean, not only tungsten to LED, but there's so much going on. And I'd love to get a sense of just from an equipment standpoint, what are you seeing really working today? And do you have any thoughts on where you think lighting equipment and, you know, lighting for filmmaking is going to be going? Well, I, I love the LED world because of the, 
redu- reduction in power and the and the and the green footstep footprint it makes. I don't like the LED units we're working with now, but I'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, I, I started out. Um, again, this will be a little shaggy. I don't mean to be that way. I started out in where you know it was all DC power and arc lights, and you know all the Hollywood stages were rigged with DC power. So it was tungsten and arc lights, and that was. And then I saw I was at the very beginning of HMI and then needing through wire sets with AC power, and again that all helped my theatrical background and portable and my knowledge of portable power from events and everything. Uh, help, everything in my life has apl- been able to apply to what I know. So learning about generators and learning about AC distribution going from DC, which is very easy. So 100% easier and less technical than what we work with today. I mean, basically, it, running an arc light is, a, is an art form. It takes a you know an actual person to pay attention, and you have to keep it mechanically running all day long. Mm. And it, but it only takes two wires, two very heavy wires. You know, it takes two pieces of two watt to run an arc. So basically, you're distributing a two wire system around the set, and uh, you know we were. But when I started, there were, I started there were 50 DPs in the world, and uh, you know, or 100 DPs, and uh, you know, we knew where everybody was, and we, you know, we had, and our film was 50 ASA, you know, 90 ASA. It was, uh, you know, 5247 was like, if I remember right, was the backbone of, uh, you know, and so we had to fill, you know. Everything had to be lit. Yeah, everything. You couldn't get away with bouncing, you know, a twelve by twelve and you know, uh, butterfly into a set and you know, reflecting sunlight and calling that fill. I mean, we had a, you know, as I call it, we had a John Wayne every set. You know, we had to have a line of arc lights on that. You know, in every actor's face. You know, the, the, the power. We, the power demands must have just been unbelievable. I can't even imagine it. Well, that's why. Trucks had two generators on them. You know, you know, it was, it was about delivering 220 DC to the sets. It wasn't about backup generator. No, the power demands were very big. And uh, you know, I could, uh, you know, there's there's gaffer porn of you know wire runs that you could walk on three deep. You know, or, you know, mil- what we call million runs and uh, stuff like that. I mean, we, I'm not going to get too technical about it. But then HMIs came in, and we went AC, and then for a long time. Stages in Hollywood were not set up for AC, and eventually we were able to put AC on the floor and keep DC up in the perms, which are the permanent uh, catwalks above stages, which you, if you don't work in LA, you really don't see. You can work at Steiner, you see them. Mm. Um, uh, and then eventually, you know, just within the past, I want to say 15, maybe 20 years we finally pretty much got rid of DC uh, everywhere. And, uh, uh, and especially with the, with electronic control, with everybody wanting to dim and the fact that, you know, digital cinematography, you could mix colors much easier and you weren't, you know, you weren't worried. See, part of this, this, here's a sidetrack. Okay. What I miss more than anything in this film business is dailies Mm. is sitting in a room with every department looking at film saying, oh, this works and this doesn't work and saying it out loud to each other and drinking a glass of wine and saying, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. And I like this scene. I don't like the scene. I, I, I don't like the color of that light because it was dim. You know, color balance was so important. We And camera assistants used to go to the dailies just to sweat. You know, they were always nervous because they never knew if they had it. Back then, the only person who knew if we had it at all was the uh, camera operator. And now camera operators have been, you know, maligned, you know, set aside. Mm. So, you know, uh, and now everybody can, you know, because of WYSIWYG, everybody sees whether it's in focus, whether it's the exposure's right. You know, I, I went to a dailies with Connie Hall and they were literally almost black. And he said, oh, I, I, I missed that exposure. <laughs> I should have not been thinking about it. And, and know, I, I, I just else. I want to clarify because I think people are going to hear you say dailies and have the wrong idea. We, we talked about this when when I visited the Fargo set, um, and and I didn't know. But we're not talking about dailies like you like you like we do now, where you would just get a bunch of files and watch them on your you know phone or your laptop no, we're or whatever. Talking about 
we're talking about sitting in a dark room with the uh, with 25 people, probably the 25 department heads on this, you know, producers, so, you know, uh, no actors, actors very seldom, were, except for Bob Altman movies ever on the set. And uh, we would sit in a dark room, drink wine, eat pizza, whatever, and see what we shot the day before because labs – Labs worked all night, and usually we could get a lot of times we could see them at lunchtime, which was always interesting for your clothing because you ended up eating your food all over yourself sitting in a dark movie theater. But you know, <laughs> but you were uh, all together, and I think that's the we important were all part. Together and we were talking about it, and you would hear the director right then go, "Oh shit, we don't have it," or "Oh, this is great," or, yeah. or whatever. You you know, people would talk about it. And the assistants would know whether it was in focus. I would know if it was exposed right. I would see what he worked and what didn't work. But it was more about the interaction between all these people. So you knew, so you felt like you were out of production. Hmm. You felt it was a, now Now you're going to need an old guy with a personality or a cinematographer or a director to pull the team together. Back then the team was formed just because we all sat in that room every night dying a little bit. Yeah, you know, yeah. Worried scared, whatever you want to say. So that, that I missed. So that's, that was the, that transition into this new digital age, you know? So anyhow, going back to your first question, I went from arc light DC power to AC power and HMI daylight exterior lighting. And then we went into electronic lighting control and putting every light on the dimmer. And you really couldn't, other than turn them off and on, you couldn't do too much queuing. You could always queue, but you couldn't you couldn't do too much arbitrary dimming because you you, you know you were exposing film and it, you really were very it was very important to have your color balance right in your lighting. Mm. Otherwise, you couldn't fix it. It wasn't you know. And then DI came in and people got sloppy about that and you could start adjusting you know uh, uh, start adjusting in post. Uh, individual colors. You can make windows and all the Kazerai that they do. And uh, then, then, you know, then electronic cinematography started. And, you know, to say there's anything bad about electronic cinematography over film is ridiculous. I mean, it's like, get a horse. It's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, you know, yes, there is a, you know, my friend Hoyta shoots 65 millimeter film and it's beautiful when projected and, you know, but it still at some point goes through a DI, an electronic process. So it's not like it's going right. For, you know, it's not like they're def- always cutting negative and that they're printing negative and that, you know, it, you know, that's a dying process. It's a gone process pretty much. And why fight it? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, 65 millimeter digital, I'm sorry, but, you know, what are there 20 people in the world who actually can tell the difference or, Maybe there's 500 people who can talk about it, but, you know, actually see the difference. You know, I mean, we're talking about millions of people in our audiences. So what are we talking about here? And uh, and then we eventually uh, transitioned into, you know, LEDs and right, relying LEDs, on that quite a bit. The main beauty of LED to me is the, is the power consumption. Is and, and I do have to say it is nice. I'm not sold on wireless remote control of LEDs yet. Because I don't think it's it's not as it's not production friendly. It takes a, a person with a you know a little more knowledge than everybody else on the set to do it, and it uh, it's not consistent. It's not reliable. Mm. And you know, it, but just like uh, you know, getting a video signal from the camera without a wire is you know it can be very unreliable. Yeah, I, you know, so it's uh, you know I'm not sold on it. My big problem with LED lighting is it gives a tool to the inexperienced, and that is color. And, you know, I'm seeing more and more people who are not trained or understand the concept of color and the usage of color on a set using it just because they can. Mm. You know, I'm seeing like blue backgrounds and, you know, uh, garish greens. I mean, it, it distracts from the story. My job and your job, my job on the set is to tell, is to deliver the script. You know, my, one of the things they teach you in theater is there's two principles of lighting you can't do without. One is 
you got to tell the audience which direction to look in and the others to make sure the actors don't trip over the scenery. Everything else is artistic. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, you mentioned a couple Everything. minutes ago that there was something that you didn't like about the current LEDs that you guys are using. What was that? It's the a bit, the simple ability to to play with color. Oh, okay. That that, that so you, color you, the, just the ability, like the RGB, you know, capable LEDs has opened up like a wide variety of color options for people. And you're you're saying that yeah. those options are kind of creating some you know bad looking stuff. It's like stuff. handheld camera. It's yeah. like handheld camera work. It's like okay, there are places where it works, and there are places where are you kidding me? You yeah. know, yeah. You know, it, it takes me out of the movie. I I studied color and light pre you know for my years in the theater. And one of the things I learned is the, that it has to be managed and it has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, and the fact is that it's so simple that a that a guy can say, "Oh, make that light orange and that light, you know, uh, lavender." Yeah. And I'm sitting here looking at it and going. Where in reality or where in storytelling, where is that helping the script? Where is that telling the story? Mm. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you do a concert scene or you want to create, you know, or you do like Victorio used to do. Victorio would present a color palette, but he would research it for months and he would make notebooks about it. And he would be very specific about what each color meant, you know, in Dick Tracy, the bad guys were red and the good guys were, you know, aquamarine, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and it was in the backlight, but they always had tungsten balanced light on their faces. You know, I, who wants to see us an actor in a blue lit bar in a blue suit with blue light on him? <laughs> Do you feel comfortable on set, you know, as a gaffer, making suggestions like that or, or providing criticism. Like, do, do you feel like, is that something that you personally do? Yes. That's mm -hmm. what I do. It's one of the things I do. I, when the things get too far one way or the other, and I feel distract from a, the look of the movie. I mean, Dana Gonzalez on this movie created a very specific look and Pete has continued and Pete has uh, what do you want to say? Added to it, it yeah. amplified. Ampli I think Pete's an amazing talent. He's so uh, good, amazing. And, and Pete Consigles, who we're talking about, he's been on the show, and Dana's been on the show too. And they both will be returning to talk about Fargo season four, and that that'll be coming up probably in April. I mean, I Dana is in, and I love Dana's energy because Dana's got an old school energy, you know, which is an enthusiasm and a rage that it takes to be creative. Mm. I, you know, I don't believe in passivity and creativity are equal. I think you have to have, I, you know, my son-in-law is a very well-known painter. And, um, who is it? Eddie Martinez. Oh. And, um, he's married to my daughter who is a very well-known and uh, you New Yorkers will see more of her work because she's doing a piece in Central Park this uh, fall. What's her name? Plug it. Sam Moyer. And, um, and Eddie, Eddie has taught me through his paintings that that energy and passion can be physically and, and visually translated. Hmm. And I see that when I work, that I don't want to work with guys who are like, oh, yeah, you know, this will be nice and let's everybody be calm and peaceful. I want to see that rage and I want to see that energy and I want to see that enthusiasm for what's going out there. Hmm. And that's what makes Dana so special in his work is that he has he has a system, he has equipment he likes to work with, he has he has a definite opinion about everything, and it's it's and it creates a completely unique work to television, and he doesn't care. In other words, you either get them or get the hell out of the way. And that's kind of how I feel about the work. Either you get me or get the hell out of the way or send me home and somebody will get me. Talk to me about your process when you are beginning a new scene, you know, beginning a new project and you are kind of starting your first day. How do you approach a scene? Well, I will have read the script. I will have had, I will have looked at other people's work related to the movie 
uh, uh, you know, the, the project. And I will, and we will have preconceived ideas. We'll have had conversations with the cinematographer beforehand, what he wants to do. And I would say 50, 50, whether any of that actually gets translated in the reality of the movie. I always, well, I'm, in some ways, there are two, I approach cinematography two ways. I, I mean, I'm not a cinematographer. Never would be, never wanted to be. I've always been in the lighting business. I believe gaffing's a terminal job. But I do know that cinematographers come from two cloaks. There's the organic, Conrad Hall, Dana Gonzalez. I can name a few. I mean, I can name a dozen of them. And then there's the cerebral, um, John Bailey, um, who I worked for for 35 years. Um, um, Victorio Storaro, who I think is one of the finest people alive today. Mm. Um, these guys are very cerebral in their approach. They read the book, they apply it to classical art, classical music, classical painting, uh, um, classical architecture, and they want to tell this, and they have it plotted out, and it takes a lot of conversation. Uh, a guy like Dana and Conrad, Dana has... You know, Dana came to me, and the only thing he knew about Fargo 4 when he really started was he wanted it to look like it was shot Kodachrome. Hmm. And I actually had a book on old Kodachrome photographs, and, uh, you know, we sat down, and he it was all about the LUT. And we learned, the, and as we learned what the LUT would give us that he designed, we learned what we could do with color and energy of light and stuff like that. But it's, it's, it's not always a cerebral process. Sometimes it's the process of turning on what you think is a perfect key light and building from there or saying that sucks. Let's do something else. Mm. And um, I believe every single thing in lighting is finding the proper key and the proper position for that key and the proper quality of that key. And then everything else will be built from that. So for There's you, no other formula for you, it starts with the key. Nothing else. Nothing else. And, you know, it's it's a little bit, uh, I mean, even Hoyta and Deacons are, are both in some ways very similar in the fact that if there is a source in the room, somehow that source becomes the key. And how we m manipulate that source is how the image, you know, how the story is, how the final image is controlled. If you have a window and the person is close to the window, He's brighter. If he's further away from the window, he's less bright. Mm. Um, it, it's just because that would, there's, it's all, I always say a good base to start is what would be the reality of the lighting in this room and then building from that. Do you go on the and, location scouts? Yes. So I have to scout everything. So when you're there and you're looking at the locations, you're figuring out, uh, you know, as you're, but rather, I should ask this as a question because that's really what it is. You're on the location scout. You're in a loose new spot. What are you looking at in that room? I'm looking at the light source. I'm looking. First of all, I got to know whether it's night or day. Mm -hmm. I want to see how much background they want to see outside the windows, and then I want to see what my lighting opportunities are based on the based on at least depends where the scout is in the process because yeah. you know on the TV you you know, you morphed into a lighting style by the second or third episode. So those scouts are more informed than your first ones. Your first ones are kind of pipe dreamy. Yeah. But you go out and you, you try to figure out where the light source is going to, where you want your key lights. It's, you know, you want to see where the actors are moving and you want to see how the light's going to support that. And you want to decide as much as you can on the quality of that light. And, you know, whether you want a shaft of light coming in from the background or whether you want a soft, soft key coming from the windows or whether we want to play the background becomes important and we want to ND the windows and put neutral densities on the windows to ex control the exterior exposure because we have to see what's going on in the backyards. I can tell stories about that kind of stuff forever. You know, those are the kind of conversations you're having. Mm -hmm. And then when you get there, some of that will work or none of it will work. At least the wires will be in the right place and you have the right number of condors to get up to those, you know, get the lights up in the air. Yeah. Other yeah. than that, it, 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 it's still an organic process. So when no you're matter. starting, when you're starting with that key light, you're looking at the environment, you're looking at the scene. 
And are you for, like, are, if there are windows in the room, are you generally thinking to yourself, okay, well, that's where the key light would come from? Yes. I mean, yes, unless, you know, it depends on what, what's on the windows, what we want to see outside the windows. Sure. But yes, yes. I mean, pr primarily that would be the, you know, natural initial source of lighting for the room. I mean, you know, I mean, you're right. I mean, you know, if there's a fireplace now, if there's a fireplace in the room, it might just be you want to see outside, but you want the warm glow of the fireplace. Sure. You know, uh, it's, you know, every scene is. Every scene will have it. You know, it, it it's it's different, but the most. Yeah. But you're beginning with the key light, no matter what, and then. No so, matter what, what is the source light in this room? So key light is decided. You already know what you're going to do. What is the next yeah. step for you? Nothing. Hmm. Allow everything else to be forced. In other words, if you see an actor go too dark on the fill side, build some fill. Use. You know, if I believe Phil is like vermouth in a martini, it should be very rationed out very gently. <laughs> um, I don't believe in false backlight, but I don't have a style. This is what's so important about a gaffer. I have to be able to adapt to whatever cinematographer I've chosen to work with yeah. wants. I'm just saying that these are general rules I use in my mind. Mm. When I, you know, I set a key light, I try not, the fill is the last thing I think about. If they want a backlight, if they want some separation from the background, do, is it silhouette? Is it, uh, you know, is it lit rim light? You know, but, you know, mostly it's how do we want to present the key? Hmm. So that's where I approach it anyway. Now, not having a style, I guess, is, it's a good thing, Um as a gaffer, because you are, style. well, but you know what I mean? Like not having a style is potentially a good thing when you're, because your job is to, you know, realize the vision of the cinematographer. But I think where your style would come into play is how you go about executing that vision. And what I saw on the Fargo set is that you're very much the leader in your department. Like you are, you're, you're right there next to the director. You're looking at the monitor. You're telling everybody where to go and what to do. And um, I think that is where your style really comes into play. Do you agree? Well, that's a learned art. You know, I mean, that's that's just a way of functioning over, you know, over experience. But yes, I mean, you got your job is to implement something specific. In other words, the director and the cinematographer have an idea, but you actually have to get the light, the wire and the light to turn on and it in the right place. And you have to do it rel relatively rapidly because you only have that 10 minutes out of every hour to do it. In. So, yes, it takes, you know, yes, it's leadership. <laughs> and there's, there's no denying it. You have to lead. <laughs> you know? you, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because I think that people that want to get into this industry, they may think to themselves, well, as a gaffer, I may, you know, I, I, the leadership is coming from the director of photography. The leadership is coming from the, from the director and I'm just following orders. That's not what I saw on set. I saw you very no. much leading your department. And I, I think people may not realize that that is an essential, you know, talent, um, you know, in your industry. I know uh, the gap. I don't know if it's essential. It's the way it's for where I came from. Uh, I think it's it, I think it's essential. I mean, even on my sets, you've worked with um, Joe McLeish before. He's he's my main gaffer that I use all the time. Yeah, and I was working on my tour. Yes. Yeah, and we talked about that a little bit when uh, at the Fargo set. But like, when Joe is just such a capable gaffer, and when he's on set, it's like I I feel like things are going to be good when he's on set. D I mean, my DPs have really great vision, obviously. Um, if I'm directing, I certainly feel confident. When, I, when I'm producing and I have other directors on, I feel confident. But when I have a very capable gaffer there, I really do feel like everything's going to be okay. Like, I think for, for those listening that may not really be hiring somebody in that role, it makes such a huge difference. Uh, same thing as me having a best boy I can depend on. Or, you know, I always say I need two lamp operators on the set that can just do what that can run the set. I can have 10 guys working, but I need two people who can actually run them too. I mean, it's all a trickle down thing. And yes, the cinematographer can spend his time. My job is to free up the cinematographer so he can be talking to the director. Yeah. Just like Mitch, just like, 
Mitch Dubin on our set as, you know, I mean, he's Spielberg's operator. He's one of the top operators in the world. Yeah. Um, Mitch, um, Mitch's job is to free up Dana to, so he can work with the director. I mean, that's our job. Our job is to free him from the, from the banal, which is not banal to us, but to him, he's got, you know, 10,000 things going and everything's a question and he can't even go to the bathroom <laughs> to, uh, <clears throat> to, uh, being able to, um, give him his time with the director. And that is our, that's our job. You've worked on so many different genres in your career. I'd love to know, do you have like a, a, a general philosophy on how to light for specific genres? No. Hmm. I don't have a specific way for a specific genre. I don't have a particular, you know, every time I think I have a night light, Hoyta taught me how to light at night completely different than anything I ever thought about, which, you know, was, was you know, giant 20 by 20 bounces from the ground. I never put a light in the air for Hoyta. Really? Everything, everything, we put a lot of grippery in the air, but we didn't, you know, all the lights came from the ground and, point, and hit it into bounces, you know, um, I did a single white female for Luciana Tovoli. Everything was a pattern. Everything was a shape. Everything was into a mirror projected through a stained glass window onto a wall. You know, everybody, I learned from every single process. And I, and I steal it. On this show, for instance, Dana really was opposed to, you know, night backlighting, which is kind of a, industry standard where you put a cut, you know, you look down the street and somebody's walking down the street, you put an 18 K down the street. And, yeah. You know, that's your backlight and you walk with a fill light <clears throat> and you know, that's how it's done. Or it looks fine. Cause then you, you know, it looks fine, but it's, it's pretty trite, but you know, taking Hoyt's education to us, we now fly, you know, 20 by 20 silks of butterfly, uh, butterflies over the set and bounce into them. And that creates kind of a soft ambient. And I started using that actually, I started using that when I got in a hurry on uh, Gilmore girls on the back lot of Warner brothers, when they'd say, Oh, let's go out and shoot the exterior of this house. And, you know, Nothing was rigged. And I'd say, well, let's just put a 20 by up in the air. And we'd put a 20, you know, a fly swatter on a condor and I'd put two M nineties on the ground and bounce into it. And the house was lit. It was beautiful. It was natural, soft, no, no messing around. So, and none of that hard backlight, shimmering, angelic crap, you know, it just was natural and beautiful. So, huh. you know, and then you bounce it and on the fill side, you set a 12 by, you know, if you said to me, light something on the street right now tonight, I would get a condor with a 20 by 20 uh, fly swatter in it. I would put two M90s on boa stand, low stands on the street. I'd bounce into the thing and I would put a nine light with a 12 by 12. Uh, with a 12 by 12 bounce camera on the fill side, and I would just dial that into taste, and that would be it, hmm. you know. So, Sa well, same question for something like okay, we're doing a comedy, but it's in you know, daytime interior. Like, what what's your go to? Very, very tricky. Well, that's a lot harder. Comedies, first of all, are a nightmare. All right, anybody says they like working on comedies, is I gotta question their sanity. <laughs> Tell um, me why. Because, because, because there is so it's it's like, humor in the film industry in the motion picture and making a funny movie is based on paranoia and fear. Okay, people are always afraid it's not funny, it's not going to work, the joke's not there, blah blah blah. So, and the other thing is, is that comedians are not always the prettiest people, and they always want to be the prettiest people. So you have to really then now we're talking about glamour lighting. And a lot of, actually, a lot of flat lighting, you know? I mean, you really have to, you know, there's not a lot of contrast in comedy, you know? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to make a general rule out of it, and plus, comedians are, you know, to be a comedian, they come from a very dark place, and they're very, and they're very insecure about their appearance. So you have to really kind of pitch kind of an open... It's a totally different. I hate them. I'll be honest with you. I hate working on comedy. <laughs> I did the Nutty Professor. It was a bloodbath. You know, uh, I feel pretty was not much fun at all. You know, I mean, these are. Uh, but then you do a movie with Sandy Bullock, and it's 
it's a joy because well, he's, I, I guess he's what, an actor. What is making it not fun? Is it the... It, it, like, oh, what makes it not fun is the paranoid of, paranoia of the writer, director, and actor, whether they're funny or not, okay. whether the joke is working. So it's not necessarily a, a lighting challenge, or is it? No, it, no. well, the lighting challenge is like any glamour lighting. They tend to be, comedies tend to be more open and full. So, of course, there's, there's you, you over, you know, you, you work... You don't dramatically light as much as you would. You don't use the lighting to tell the story as much as you would because you want the comedian to be seen and the joke to be seen and told. Yeah. So there's, it's more of an, it's actually used a lot more light, but it's, um, you know, it's a whole philosophy I'm not particularly in love with. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I mean, I've heard that certainly before. Um, on the flip side, I've heard a lot of people say that they enjoy horror movies because you can light more dramatically. It's a lot more freedom. It's darker. It's a little bit more interesting. Do you feel the same way? Because you've certainly yeah, done a whole bunch 100%. of- 100%. I, mean, I, did, I did the original Child's Play and- uh, Yeah. And we had a lot of fun on that movie. You know, I was with Bill Butler. I love Bill Butler. You know, he's about 97 years old right now. That's but amazing. He's, I know, but he was, but his contribution to the world, you know, I mean, we had a lot of fun on the road together and, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, yes, I've done, I did, uh, I did Wes Craven's last movie, which was a disaster, but working with Wes Craven was one of life's greatest moments. Why was it know? a disaster? I don't know, because he wasn't into it, and he went into production too fast, and we ended up shutting down after 65 days of shooting, yeah. and they restart, they reshot the whole, it was, it was just, a, and then Wes died, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, um, and he was one of the, he was a, not, see, people surprise you, I mean, he was a, he's a real cinema guy, you know, he really knew story, and he, you know, uh, Everything else. I'm trying to think. Oh, I did Poltergeist three, which was another neurotic, neurotic drama. But it was about a guy. The director, uh, Gary Sherman, went to yeah, I don't know. He went to optic school or something at, at IIT instead of like film school. But he decided he wanted to do all the effects in camera, and uh, so and Alex Napomishi was shot it, and uh, I mean it worked out. I mean. It, but it was also, you know, every so Gary, and that's a kind of a funny story is because we went in a production, we went in the production meeting on it. The production meeting lasted for 14 hours and uh, we're sitting there, Pete Cutner, the camera assistant, and I, after Gary Sherman tried to explain optically how every single shot in the movie was going to work with mirrors and different lenses. And this is Poltergeist 3 you're talking about? Yeah, and uh, you know, and you know, it's before blue screen, so no visual effects at all in that movie, and uh, um, and you know, special effects. It, it went on for fourteen hours. At the end of the day, Pete and I turned to each other and said, "What the hell did he just say?" <laughs> <laughs> and the fact is, is that uh, Bill Butler taught me one thing after in. You know, Bill Bill was a great philosopher of this business. This is a man who didn't become a cinematographer until he was 50 years old, and his second movie was Jaws. Jesus. Um, Bill said, remember one thing. When everybody's talking, movies are made one shot at a time. One shot at a time. Mm. Just don't, don't get ahead of yourself, because one shot will reveal the next shot will reveal the next shot. This is probably an impossible question to answer. And you can have multiple. I'll allow it. But do you have a favorite film or show that you've worked on? You know, people ask that all the time. Yeah, I, I mean, it, how do you answer it? But I'm curious if you if you have, like, if something, you know, stuck in your head as one that maybe was more challenging or more re rewarding or you learned a lot well, from. I'm a social guy. So the ones I had the most fun on are the ones that stick in my mind, you know, so... Norman Mailer hanging out in Provincetown with him on Tough Guys Don't Dance had to be one of the most fun movies of all time. The movie was crap. Uh, <laughs> um, um, Prince. Oh, man, I spent four months with Prince every day. Oh, my I God. I loved the guy. 
he went to parties every Wednesday night in his studio because he didn't like to go out in public too much. So he would send his guys out to, you know, like hit the clubs and bring people back to the studio. And we'd dance all night on Wednesday nights. And it was the most fun ever. Wow. Movie was total crap. Um, movies I'm proud of. Are you I'm talking about Graffiti still- Bridge? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that must and, have been such an experience. Wow. Oh, well, because a weekend he he had hired uh, some guy with a funny name. Anyhow, he got he fired his DP and uh, moved on to uh, moved on to excuse me uh, moved on to uh, hired Bill Butler to finish the movie. And Bill Butler came and he says, "Well, I've done Grease." The <laughs> prince said, "So what? What does that mean?" And your 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 phone thinks you're talking to her. I'm sorry. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it off. No, and, don't you know, worry about it. So Prince hires Bill Butler at 80 years old to come in and shoot Graffiti Bridge. And Bill doesn't know who Prince is by any means and thinks he's shooting a musical like, uh, what was the one he did with John Travolta? Um, Grease. Grease. Yeah. And uh, I have, you know, I had a little rock and roll experience, but this is the first time I ever saw uh uh, a robotic light and they were you know we had 12 of them that, like the first 12 that ever existed and it was a great it was fun but it was you know roping you know getting bill on the page and the prince liked them i mean it was funny it was great it was the movie was terrible he probably it, liked that he right. didn't have a fan do, you know shooting this thing you know somebody that just isn't concerned with the fact that prince is who he is just somebody coming on and filming it i mean just that, filming and and that's what he wanted because he had had a fan who was you know a bit of a cokehead and a bit of a partier on the start of the film and he couldn't you know and Prince doesn't like any of that stuff around never liked any of that stuff around yeah so, yeah so yeah. you know so they got the two Walter Cockers me and Bill Butler in there and uh, and we had fun it was pretty great it do you ever fun. do you ever kind of know that a film is going to be garbage while you're making it or is it something you sort of see at the end uh no i'm a really i you know i want to be a producer i i want to help my friends get their movies made and all this stuff but the fact of the matter is i have scripts that i absolutely love that turn out to be total crap Mm. and i have movies that i read and i go this is total crap that come out to be big hits there are movies that i think were written much better and i miss great parts of like uh, as good as it gets um, uh, I read that script and I thought it was the best written script but with the funniest shit I ever read in a script. And as it became such a bloodbath shooting it, we were all, we only shot about seven eighths of a page. Let's just say one page a day. It was a 142 page script. Oh my God. And, and, um, we shot forever on that movie. So it became a, and, and Jim Brooks, who is a, literal genius really is a cup half empty kind of guy. You know, I don't know if I have it. He worries. I liked him. I mean, I liked him, but he made, he makes for a very tense working environment only because, uh, you know, he's, he doesn't know whether he gets it. He's go, does it over again. And it's a, it's a very unique experience, but studios, well, first of all, he owns the Simpsons. So he's, you know, bulletproof. He's the richest guy in the world. And the other thing is, he, um, he he has had some hit films, so studios are always willing to give him whatever whatever he wants on a movie. But you know, you read that script, and you went, while you're making it, you think nothing is working out the way I read the script. But it it came out great. You know, uh, risky business I thought was the worst piece of garbage I ever read, and boy, it came out great. <laughs> I love that. What Breakfast Club. Breakfast Club, uh, nobody knew where that would go. You know, it was like, what is this? And it was, and it did become kind of like a kumbaya experience for John and the actors. And we shot for 90 days, you know, mm. 90 days in that library. Wow. And, you know, 12 hours a day. It's like keeping people awake up in that balcony, not snoring during the takes was half my job. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh my God, that's the best. You know, I mean, you know, 
uh, you know, if you look at the film and, you know, there was a balcony all around the library and literally half the crew was lying down on the floor of that balcony, you know, close to the edge so the camera couldn't see him, lying down, reading books or snoring. <laughs> Why was it so slow paced? Because John, like I said, it was a kumbaya movie. John would sit and really, he for for about up through Ferris Bueller, John Hughes knew exactly his audience and knew how to get what he needed from actors. Yeah. And after Ferris Bueller, he lost it, which is not unusual. Four movies was pretty, three or four movies, three, three movies, I think. It was uh, 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, and Ferris Bueller. Yeah. He had a total control of, the, of who he was talking to. But then, then things started falling apart, and he saw it, and he that's when he met that's when he got Chris Columbus involved and did Home Alone. And then Chris Columbus had a few hit, you know, was able to hold an audience for a period of time. But, but John, John really got uh, Molly and those actors. There was a lot of sitting in a circle going, how would you react? To, you know, how do you feel about this? You know, and then we would shoot it. We would shoot it. The emotions. I mean, it was very, it was a completely different filmmaking. It was actual, it was more theatrical. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It was almost, I mean, it was kind of a stage performance in a way. Same thing with 16 Candles. Same thing with, uh, you know, know, it was about him sitting on the floor with them and saying, okay, now how are we going to do this? Or how do you feel about this? Or, you know, I mean, her putting the lipstick on in that circle we shot for three days, you know, it it was just the way he was able to get performances out of these guys. Mm. Have you ever worked on a film that you just absolutely loved, but just didn't hit an audience? Not that it's a bad film, but something where you're almost like, how how could this not have worked? Because it's so good, but it just didn't reach an audience. Oh, I felt that way about the whale movie with John, uh, with uh, Drew Barrymore. Uh, big thing. The studio changed the name from Everybody Loves Whales, and it was based on a true story about the first actively talked between uh, Gorbachev and uh, Reagan. And uh, and it, it's about these three whales that are caught in the ice up in Alaska. But the studio changed the name to The Big Miracle. And, uh, and I already said, what is this, a religious movie? And, you know, and, and I thought it was a pretty good. It was. I loved the script from the beginning, you know. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I read a script with a certain character should be cynical and they come out not. You know, they don't pull it off. And I, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, we've all done a lot of, but I always feel like every movie I've worked on, every movie I see, I can pull out a few minutes of of greatness out of it. Yeah. I believe, I believe I can find the point in it somewhere along the line. So I don't hate anything a hundred percent. Who have you been the most starstruck with? Nicholson, mm. Eastwood. Eastwood and I became kind of friends, so I, I really like Eastwood. Um, uh, you know, all the women at Steel Magnolias, you know, mm. all the women on Yaya Sisterhood, holy cow. I mean, I can't believe that, you know, I go out to dinner with Maggie Smith and uh, Fanula Flanagan and, uh, you know, and, you know, and, uh, you know there, are, there, are, there are actors I truly love to be with. I mean, Sandy Bullock, is one of the great personalities. Or I'm not sure she's a you know Shakespearean actor by any shape, you know, you know, or a method actor, but she is one of the most charming people of all time. You know, uh, I like Goldie Hawn. You know, uh, I don't know. I you know it's funny. I don't get starstruck by actors. I well, you know, when we did it in the Line of Fire in D.C., I was starstruck by politics. You know, by Ed Kennedy. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. I can I can imagine at this point in your career, especially I mean you've just seen so many people, but it, it, it is interesting. You know you've you've really worked with everyone. I mean at really high level much. people in this industry. Yeah. And um, well, we were talking about that. You know, raging bull. The book raging. I forget the first title. Something in raging bulls. Um, the book about the American New Wave. Uh, Paul. You know, Pauline Kael's boys. But I've worked with every single person in that book. Mm. Uh, what's the book I'm thinking of? Something in Raging Bull. Uh, yeah. I can't think of you it. Know, I can't think of it, but I, I know it. Um, you know, because I worked with, I've done two films with Schrader. I've done two films with Scorsese. I've done 
you know, I've met the Palma on uh, the, you know, they wanted me to do the untouchables, but it was too early in my career to take on a picture like that. And, uh, you know, um, and everybody, else, you know, stayed friends with Schrader all these years. You know, it, it's kind of cool. You no, know? hmm. part of the, you know, consider myself part of the Larry Caston family, you know, because all that because of Bailey and Carol, you know. So. Is there a director uh, or cinematographer that you haven't worked with yet that you really want to? I did. I did want to work. I did work with Connie a little bit. I always wanted to work with him. I, uh, uh, I, I socially know Victorio. I never actually got a chance to work with him. They're old guys. Uh, the new guys, eh, no. <laughs> eh, not really. Oh my God. That's oh, the best. Caleb and I, Caleb, Caleb and I talked about doing uh, Titanic. And of course he got fired on it. And I, uh, I, I, didn't do it because I did as good as it gets with John got as good as it gets at the same time. So I went and did that with him, which has many stories about that. So we got a question from Instagram. Uh, the name here, I don't know how to pronounce. So I'm going to spell it out, but I think it's Reina to Hoya, R-E-N-A-T-O-H-O-J-D-A. So thanks for following us on Instagram. And uh, this person's question is, is the lighting department the best way to become a cinematographer? Uh, no, hmm. it's one way. More so lately than it was 20 years ago. In our last couple of minutes, I want to address a few things specifically for those people that want to get into the lighting department, film, TV. They want to be a gaffer. Uh, let's first start with how do you break into this industry? Uh, there's two ways. One is to find other crews and put your name put your name out. In other words, there are a million things with you, you know, because gaffers have to be known follow the industry, put your, put your resume in, talk to people, uh, put your name on the out of work. List. You know, I always, I, I being a, a union member and a, a proud union member is to put your name on the out of work list at the union at, to be a permit. You get enough permit days, you'll get into the union. So what does that mean? Uh, just now we're, we're talking uh, specifically to people that have never done this before. They just want to get into it. So I want to be, I want to offer some real guidance to them. All right, call your local IATSE office, International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Call them. They have what's called an, um, uh, a permit list. Now, if you live in Atlanta, Chicago, New York, Boston, or L.A., probably uh, what you might call it, New Mexico, um, uh, New Orleans, uh, there is not enough help. To do all the work that is there, and it costs a production company. I don't know what is it about. I don't know something like three or four thousand dollars a week to bring somebody in from out of town over what it would cost for a local to work on a movie. So the fact is, is uh, it, it, as a local, you uh, you go to your individual IATSE local. You put your name on what's called the permit list, and you take every job that's thrown at you. Now, if you're in Chicago, Atlanta, New York, Boston, the sister cities, they call them, mm. uh, New Orleans, you can do every craft. One union covers carpenters, uh, set decorators, painters, gaffers, grips, whatever. And uh, they're, they're called studio mechanic locals, and those are the ones you get the best shot at getting – getting work out of uh, LA has a little different permit system, but again, there is so much product being manufactured out there and we have an incredible need for labor. Please just go to your local IATSE, find the business agent, put your name on the list, get out there and get known. So it's I A T S E. And if you go to I A T S E.net, that seems like a really good resource, at least to get started to maybe find your local representatives. Right. And call them. Talk on the phone. Don't text. Don't send emails. Don't do any of your millennial communication stuff. <laughs> call these guys and say, look, I would like to work in the film industry. You know, here's what I say about – here's one of my rules is, is you have to decide what your dream job is. And then there are different entry levels for those dream jobs. Hmm. But if you're going to be below the line, 
you got to, you, you know, either, go in, you know, local 600, you want to do camera, it's the same thing. You want to become a trainee in the camera department. There's a whole process for that. And they need people. They desperately, desperately need people. But they need functional people. Yeah. They're not, we're, you know, we're not, we're not Walmart. We actually, you know, there are skills involved. In them. So, yeah. but they have to be developed and nobody's expecting you to know them all. How do people prepare themselves to be valuable on set? Create good relationships with people. Have, be able to develop trust from a cinematographer to be able to interpret what he wants you to do. It's about personal relationships. You need nothing. You used to need meters. You used to need stuff. You don't need anything anymore. Just the ability to talk on a radio, get people to do what you want them to do, and to be able to interpret and become develop a visual language with the cinematographer and make him comfortable in his work. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming on Go Creative Show and sharing your experiences. Um, Mike Moyer, you can find him on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash Mike G Moyer, M-O-Y-E-R. And um, lastly, you got to tell me about this nickname, Moish. All the whole time I was on the Fargo set, I heard everybody calling you Moish. I'm saying, what is this all about? Why is that your name? Because I, when I first started gaffing in 1985 or whatever, uh, even before that, 84, um, I used to, you know, you'd, you'd set up, you'd focus a light and you would put the white diffusion in front of it. And, it would, and I'd say, well, mush the light out, you know, put the mushy shit in front of the light. And, uh, you know, that's about as technical as I got. It was 216 or whatever it was in those days, uh, you know, soft frost or whatever. Anyhow, I'm on the set of Nothing in Common with Jackie Gleason and uh, Gary Marshall. And uh, everybody was calling it. So everybody called me Mushy because they said mush out the lights. And uh, I don't know, Jackie made a big deal out of it one day about a bunch of Goyim screwing up the name Moishi. His name's Moishi. God damn it, it's Moishi. <laughs> it means Moses. I, mean, I don't know what happened that day, but it went from Mushy to Moshe. And uh, uh, it has stayed that way. There are people in this business who only know me. As well. I was up for a job, and uh, the producer, the U, the new UPM, I, UPMs are a whole problem today, and I'll tell you about that some other time. But um, Oh, you can't open can of worms like that right at the last minute of the show. The new, uh, UPM turned to the producer and said, oh, this new gaffer, Mike Moyer, never heard of him. Well, then says, that's Moish, Moish, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, my God. Uh, it's like, I, I don't know. It's just been a nickname that it's funny. I can't stand my family saying it, you know, like calling me that. Like at a dinner table. If I hear it at a dinner table or a family event, I go, oh, my, I crawl. But at work, it seems just perfectly natural. So. If you want to reach out to Mike, you can find him on Instagram at um, Mike G. Moyer. You can also email him, Mike G. Moyer at iCloud.com. And um, Mike, thank you so much for being on. That was that was a really fun episode, lots of information, and uh, I wish you luck out there. Well, thanks. I, I just hope to go back to work in a couple of weeks, that's all. I want to thank Mike Moyer for coming on the show and talking about his experiences. It's amazing what this guy has done in his career, and he's still doing it. I absolutely love that. Um, you know, I learned a lot. I hope you did, too. I learned a lot about unions. I learned a lot about uh, what a gaffer does and what they're responsible for, and that's what the show is all about. Education, sharing knowledge, and making all of us here in the Go Creative Show world better filmmakers. So thank you, Mike, for coming on and sharing your stories. I also want to thank Matt Russell. He mixes and masters and makes this show sound so good, and he can do it for you. He can do it for you, too. So find him on uh, Twitter at GainStructure, at GainStructure, and, of course, his website, GainStructure.com. And our producer, Connor Crosby, who's putting the whole show together behind the scenes. You can find him at IgnitionVisuals.com, IgnitionVisuals.com. If you want to follow me, and why wouldn't you? Follow me on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all of those places. But I have to say, honestly, Instagram is the place to go for me because that's where I'm the most active. You can see a whole bunch of behind the scenes stuff that I'm doing, what my production company is up to. Uh, I've been sharing a lot of just general filmmaking information over there. It's fun. I love it. And I love interacting with the Go Creative Show fans. So you can find me at Ben Consoli at Ben 
Consoli. And of course, our sponsor, Host Lab, stress-free collaboration for Final Cut Pro 10. Get more information and a three-month trial at gocreativeshow.com forward slash post lab. But all things Go Creative Show are right there on the website, gocreativeshow.com. Let us know what you think of the show. Let us know if you have any guest suggestions and follow us on social media so you can have your question heard on the next episode of Go Creative Show. See you guys next week. Bye-bye.